and these two will be closely related. And the reason that we want to do this is because abelian varieties, for in many situations, are easier to study than curves. So we can try to study the abelian variety, learn things there, and then translate information back to curves. And so, in particular, I mean, later on, we're going to do this when we study the modular curve in Jacobian, and we're going to prove that maybe not it's Jacobian, but some quotient of it has rank zero, and then use that to control the rational points in our original curve. So that's one reason that we're in that in these Jacobian for this class. All right, so I'm going to begin by doing the construction over the complex numbers, where you can use uh, an analytic construction a little more uh, straightforward. So to begin with, uh, x is going to be a smooth projective connected curve over C of genus G. Uh, I'm going to write V for its space of global one forms. So this is a G-dimensional complex vector space. So I'm going to write uh, H1 ground H1 for dr of x. So the first real theoretical model, even though it matters because the border is so close. So for this, I'm just regarding x as a two-dimensional real manifold, and I'm taking the uh, smooth uh, closed one forms on x, not the jack forms. It's the real smooth closed. So this is a G, two G dimensional real vector space. Okay, so first I want to do some things relating V and the ground ball homology. I guess we call this the Hodge theory of curves. So, so first of all, uh, every, every element in V is a closed form. And that's because all well, these locally things in D look like f of z dz, where d is a local parameter on the curve. And if you do d of, d of this, you get f prime of z dz wedge dz, and dz wedge dz is zero. So since everything in D is closed, uh, we can regard it as an element of parameter homology, at least if we tensor up to C. So, this means we get a map from D to the ground homology and so that's And the first thing I want to say is that this map is in general. Suppose you had some global holomorphic one form omega and it were exact. So it's dF, where f is some smooth function on x. So f is some smooth function on x and it's dF, it's a holomorphic one form, so it doesn't have any dz bars if you use dF. So that's, that's a kosher even equation is equivalent to saying that f is holomorphic. So this implies that f is holomorphic. So f is a holomorphic function defined in all of x, so it's a constant. So since it's constant, this d is zero. The only thing that our co-boundaries are just the zero. Okay, and so can also consider the complex conjugate space that which I'll call V bar. And you can think of that as uh, like global anti homomorphic forms. And of course, that's also going to inject into here, into this, this thing on the right. And what I want to say now is what would be called the Hodge decomposition. Which is that this complex theorem homology is the direct sum So this is saying that if you have any 
one form that's closed on X. Then you can replace it by an exact one form. Write the result as whole thing plus name. So here's the proof. So we have a natural map like this. And I want to show that that map is injective. Okay. And since I'm regarding each of D and D bar as subspace on the left side and each of other intersection there is zero. So I'm going to define an operator on this space um, as follows. So let J be the map on the, the tangent spaces, which is multiplication by I. Each tangent space of X is a one-dimensional complex vector space, and so we have multiplication by I map. And this is the you know a nice smooth family of maps defined over X. So if I have any one form on X omega. I'm going to define omega c to be the following thing. So I multiply by minus i on the outside, and then I compose with j. So remember, a one form is something that at each point assigns uh, you know, something in uh, a map tx to c. So I pre compose with this linear map of tx, then applying omega, and then scaling back to the side. And the point is that if you're a holomorphic one form, then your differential is complex linear. So when I multiply by i on the inside, that comes out as multiplying by i on the outside. That cancels this minus side. So the things which are holomorphic are fixed by c. And similarly, the things which are anti-holomorphic get multiplied by minus 1. So b lives inside the c equals 1 eigenspace on D bar is inside the minus one eigenspace. And this implies that they're disjoint, linearly disjoint. So that means that this map is injected, but the two sets have the same dimension. Right? This thing has dimension 2g, and each one of these things has dimension g. And the last thing I want to say before defining the Jacobian is um, something in terms of how the pairing on your homology looks in terms of this picture. So suppose I have two one forms that are real. And 
I look at their projections when they get the data. Then if you have this integral of alpha wedge beta, that's a two form one x, that's the volume form so you can integrate it to get a number. This is equal to what, twice the real part of the integral over x of omega wedge a bar. And the reason for this is very easy. I mean, just write alpha as omega plus omega bar and beta as eta plus eta bar. And then the point is that omega wedge eta is zero because it has a dz wedge dz. Similarly, omega bar wedge eta bar is zero. So when you look at the wedge, alpha wedge beta, you just get omega wedge eta bar plus omega bar wedge eta. And the integral of this over x is the complex conjugate of the integral of that over x. So the integral of alpha wedge beta is just, I mean, we know it's real. The real parts of these two things are equal. Twice the real part. The integral of this. And there's a nice way to rephrase this for what we're about to do. So I'm going to define a Hermitian form on our space V. takes in two holomorphic one forms. And what you do is you integrate over x of omega wedge eta bar and you multiply by two times i. So you need that i there to make this Hermitian. Because uh, you want the property that you do the complex time to get this. You get this. And for that, you need this i. Otherwise, you have a minus i. So this result here, you can rewrite using the summation form as saying that uh, the integral of alpha wedge beta is the imaginary part of the summation form. So if you have an element of this L, one cycle, and you have a holomorphic one form, then you can integrate that one form over the cycle to get a number. And if you fix gamma, then you can regard this construction as a function that takes B to C, which is a linear map. So for each element of gamma, we have an element of B. dimension 2G, it's a complex of dimension G, and this is a Z module of rank 2G. So of course you would like that this is a lattice of So 
there's some, there's one little subtlety in what I just said, which is, So if I have if I have some element of V, then I can build an element of the real goal by sending some thing here to first evaluating and then taking the real part. That's a real goal that. And that's a nice morphism of V with the real goal of the complex. There is an identification, but it's there's something we have to do in there. Okay. And then you can identify this thing just by the Durand theorem with H1 Durand. Like that. And now if you trace through the identification, so you have to keep this kind of thing in mind, this map sends a form omega to omega plus omega bar. And we know that that's nice. That shows that when I tensor up with R, this map of I is a nice morphism, and that's what you need to set delta minus. Okay, so since we have a nice lattice, we can make the quotient, and it's going to be a complex torus. So that's the G quotient. form H star or information form on B dual. And the way that I'm going to do that is as follows. Uh, let J be the isomorphism of B with B dual. It takes the vector B, maybe I'll call it the vector omega, to the linear map H of something omega. So this is an isomorphism of uh, real vector spaces, but it's not complex linear because H is conjugate linear in the secondary. This is a conjugate linear isomorphism And then I'll define H star on lambda and mu or two elements of E star by just moving them back to V and then applying the H. And we switch the order to the right kind of linear. Okay. By switching the order, it makes H star linear in the first spot, conjugate linear. So this is a Hermitian form on V star, and it's obviously positive definite. And then the key fact is the following proposition. If you do this H star on two elements of the lattice, so let's say you have gamma and gamma prime and L, you apply I to them to get to V star. By this relation form, and you take its imaginary part, you get the pairing between gamma and gamma prime. So the intersection pairing on each one. And the proof of this, I'm not going to do all the details, there's a lot of going through just various identifications I've made. But you can extend both pairings on each side to the real vector space, LR, and then you can transfer to its dual. And if you do that, then this pairing on the left side 
is given by alpha, beta, maps to the imaginary part of H of P alpha, P beta. Left hand side. And the right hand side, that's the kind of standard pairing homology. Alpha, beta, maps to the integral over X of alpha, beta. Okay, so you have to go through the definition and unwind things to see what these things uh, they work like this, but they do, and we previously showed the piece. So corollary of this result is that the Kobe of X is principally is a principally polar the Billing Okay, let me just list some basic properties that are very easy. So first of all, the tangent space at the identity of the sky. And you see right from the definition, there's V star model lattice, so this is V star. And that's the same thing as H1 X coefficients in O, that's their property. Um, the dually, you see that the cotangent space at the identity is V. And since you know in a viewing variety, a, a global one form draw translation of that. So you just get that by taking something at the origin and translating. So that shows that the global one form of the Jacobian are naturally isomorphic to the space B. Of course, that was defined to be the global one form of X. The curve in the Jacobian has the same one form. Also, the curve in the Jacobian has the same first integer. <coughs> Since the Jacobian is defined as V star mod L, and V star is just some simply connected thing, the first homology is just going to be L by definition. And I guess the H2 there. 
and that maps to H2O, which is zero. So you get this exact sequence. Okay, so H1 with coefficients in O star take X. And H2X with coefficients in Z is Z. Because X is an orientable surface. And this map here is the degree map. And then this thing here, in, this is the tangent space at zero of the Jacobian, so V star. And this thing is isomorphic to H lower. That's one grade lobby. And so this thing here is the Jacobian. Let's fix a base point in our curve X. So if you do this, then you can define a map from X to Jacobian. It depends on the choice of point. And the way it works is as follows. Suppose you have another point Y X. Pick a path, um, row from X to Y. And then using row, you can build an element of V dual a map from B to C by sending it one form, which is the integral over this path row of omega. That's not going to be stuck. So that, of course, doesn't just depend on x and y, but also the choice of row. Right? The point is that if you pick two different paths from x to y, it'll differ by you know, a loop at x, which you can think of as an element of h1. So the ambiguity choice of row is just up to elements of I of L. So this element of V star well defined to I of L. So this means that you get this map FX from X to the Jacobian. Takes the point Y to this form. It has the property, of course, that it sends x to zero. Because when you were x goes, you can take the zero path. So that certainly depends on the choice of x. Which point goes to zero? X. And so, in fact, this is the universal map from x to an abelian variety. So, if you have any map from x to an abelian variety and it sends x, the point x to zero. Factor through that. Okay, so now we'll move on to the algebra theory. We're going to define Jacobians for curves over any field, not just over complex numbers. And so the definition, of course, that we gave here is not going to work because it's an analytic definition. And the key is to use this description in terms of line number right? just to raise. So this is just like wanting to find the dual of the right? First define it as a portion of it. Realize that a parameterized line bundle is going to be using that to define the algebra. So I want to begin by writing down the functor of points of the Jacobian in the algebra situation in terms of line bundles. There are some subtleties that come in. So K is now going to be any field, and X is going to be our smooth connected projective curve over k. And so we want to like we want to take pick zero x and 
give it the structure of a variety. Whenever you are in algebraic geometry and you have like a set of things and you want to give it the structure of a variety, a good way to go about doing that is to first understand what you mean by a family of such things. That will tell you the functor of points you're looking for. So we need to understand what do we mean by a family of elements of pick naught over some base T. So a good notion of family, so a family of elements of pick naught over t is just a line bundle on x times t. And I'm going to write x sub t for x times t, which just restricts the degree 0 in each file. Restriction of l to x times t is degree 0. We can pull this line bundle from T back to X. T star L is the line bundle on X to T. And it, it's trivial in each file, right? If we pick a point of T and look at the restriction of this line bundle to that fiber, that's the trivial line bundle on X, which is the pullback of the fiber of L and T. So T star of L restricted to X times. So that says two things. First of all, it's degree zero. So the, this line bundle moves into this half of T. And that means it should be classified by a map, which is representing the object. So it's so by degree zero. So these are all classified by a map. So classified, I mean, there's the map from T to J such that the pullback of the universal bundle is the bundle that we have. But since the restriction is trivial for each T, I mean, if you look at the image of little t under this map, that's supposed to be the line bundle corresponding to the one on this fiber, which is trivial. So every point has to map to the same point in J, right? the one corresponding to the trivial bundle. 
f of t and j corresponds to the trivial level. So that means that f is a constant map. And that means that the pullback of this L, the universal bundle by f, is a trivial bundle. Right, so that shows that our non script L has to be trivial. If this thing's trivial, these are equal. But that doesn't have to be the case. I mean, L, we could have started with a non trivial. L may not be kind of, may not be trivial. This is a contradiction. Okay, so that contradicts this suppose. Suppose that this represents it. It just can't be because of this kind of stupid reason. So there's an easy way to fix this, and that's just to kind of kill off all things that were causing a problem. So define g of t to be f of t modulo the subgroup of things that come from t. So if t is a field, then pick of t is 0, and so g of t is equal to f of t. So again, I mean, when you plug in k, you just get pick not x, which is what you want. So this has the same k points as pick not x. And now it doesn't have this problem that we see. Okay, but this thing is still not representable. This is the second problem, problem two. And that's that pick doesn't have good descent properties. Let me kind of show you why this doesn't work out. So pick a finite Galois extension, or an infinite Galois extension. So Galois extension with group gamma. So if, if G were a sheet, then I mean if it's I mean you have a map from G of K to the fixed points in G of K. And obviously, if G is representable, I mean, then this functor of points is just the solution to some variety, and this will be an isomorphism. So a necessary condition that something be representable is that maps like this are isomorphs. And that's just one part of the sheet condition, the special case of the sheet axis. But I'm saying that it doesn't, that this map doesn't have to be an isomorphism in our particular case. And so I'm going to, for the next few minutes, talk about pick instead of for G, just to Things psychologically easier than the same field points of the up to this degree zero. So here's kind of how things work in this situation. So there's an exact sequence. Here, there's a Brouwer group obstruction to it actually coming from there. So I'll, I'll actually prove this. So there's two steps. The first is to show that this map is an injection, and the second is to explain how this obstruction works. Okay, so the first step, we want to consider two line bundles on X, and assume that when we map when we restrict every k bar that they're isomorphic. Then we want to show that the original line bundles are isomorphic. So let L and L prime be in pick x and assume that they're isomorphic over k prime. Over k prime. So 
So we want to conclude that they're isomorphic over K. And we could do that if I were Galois, right? Because then it would just descend down. But it doesn't have to be Galois. That's the problem. So if we pick some sigma in our Galois group, then we can conjugate this isomorphism by that element. And since these guys are defined over K, it still defines an isomorphism between them. And so I have these two possibly different isomorphisms between the same thing. And so they must differ by an automorphism of the source of the target. Right. But the automorphism group of, of this LK prime is just the multiplicative group of K prime. Um, that's because an automorphism sheaf of L, you can think of it as a sheaf on the Zerski topology on X is just GM, right? All morphisms of line bundle are just scales. And the global sections of GM over X is just the multiplicative of the phase field because it's a proper curve. So this means these two things differ by some element here. So I can write I sigma is C sub sigma times half, where C sub sigma is an element. And it's not hard to see that this C thing is a one cosine. So C defines an element in H1 to Galois, which is K times star. And what does that repeat? I hear people whispering. Oh, <laughs> Hilbert's there in 90. So that means that you can write C sigma as sigma acting on alpha divided by alpha for some alpha. That's what the co-boundaries are, right? It's the same. Your C is a co-boundary. And then if you look at alpha inverse times I, that is Galois. Because that descends down. So that's injective. Okay, so now I want to explain this Brouwer uh, obstruction. So the reason this nap is not necessarily subjective, the way the problems come in, is something here is a line bundle on x k prime. It satisfies the condition that all of its Galois conjugates are isomorphic, meaning that any two Galois conjugates, there exists some isomorphism. But you're not giving any information about those isomorphisms. So they don't necessarily satisfy you know, the conditions to give descent. You need some cosine condition of the system of isomorphisms to descend down. So that's why it doesn't necessarily have to descend down. You just have some random system of isomorphisms. But you can measure how bad this system of isomorphisms fails to satisfy the descent axis. That is some Brouwer group. So here's how it works. So suppose that I have some line bundle in take x, take y, fixed by gamma. Okay, so what that literally means, like I was just saying, is that for each sigma in the Galois group, you can pick some isomorphism from L to its conjugate. And then if you have two elements, you can go from L to sigma star of L by I sub sigma. And then you can apply sigma star to I sub tau. And that will go to sigma star tau star L. Or you could have just done I of tau sigma. So you have two ways from getting from L to this thing. And again, these are two different isomorphisms of a, a line bundle, and so they're going to differ. By, uh, yeah, for the same reasons over there. So we can write I of tau sigma as some C sub sigma tau of this composition. And then you can show that these, the C again satisfies the two cosine. <coughs> 
general in the star. And again, I mean, if this co-cycle is actually a co-boundary, then you can write it as a co-boundary, use that to modify these choices of I sigma, and then you can make it so that this diagram actually commutes. And that's what the center is. If you have some system of isomorphisms that commutes like this, then that will descend L down. So that's why if this Brouwer obstruction vanishes, you actually do Okay, so let me do, I'll say a few remarks. I'll give an example of this. So, so one, here's an example. Um, take a genus zero curve, it's not Q1. So that means the bundle O of 1 on xk prime is Galois invariant. But it doesn't descend to here, because if you had O of 1 down here, that would give a nice isomorphism over k to q1. Examples I've said so far don't actually construct a counterexample of the kind that we need because I haven't said anything about the degree here. Over here, the counterexample I was talking about was degree one, this like the whole one closure. And if you go back to the things that we care about, this F and G, they were degree zero. Bundles. I don't actually know an explicit example offhand of the degree zero line bundle at tail, but I believe that they exist. And I, I think you can probably find one on the genus one curve at that point. Do you know how? On a degree zero line bundle here, it doesn't come up here. I think if you take a genus one curve at that point, so the QP can probably get one. Okay, but anyway, that sort of th this is the, the kind of thing that can go wrong, in here. and that, that's the reason this descent property fails, and so G is not a sheet in general. We won't need this. When you look at the divisors on the x defined over the base field, 
each one has a degree, and you take the two cities. So like in this example, uh, if you take like this curve, then like any point on it is defined over a degree two extension. So all the lines just have even degrees. This is called the period of X. Okay, so things go bad in general. But in fact, everything's okay if X has a point. Explain why that's the case. So let's fix a point. And let me define a category. I'll call it script of G sub X for each DT. So this is going to be the, the category of pairs. L comma I. Where L is a line bundle on X times T, which has degree zero each fiber. And I is an isomorphism of L when you restrict to this section, the trivial bundle on T. So you're just trivializing the bundle along this section. And then I'm going to let uh, g x of t without this kind of description. Bond be the set of isomorphs. The point of this is that it follows from like general considerations that this script G of X, everything kind of works well there. And we haven't really done anything bad, like take isomorphs in the classes or anything. So you could say that this is a step. And the point is that this I that we've imposed rigidifies the category. No objects in this category have automorphs. All the automorphs are trivial. Because I mean, such a thing would be forced to be scaling by something, but this isomorphism requires the scaling to just be by one. So G of X, the stack, and the automorphism groups are all trivial. So that means that when we take isomorphism classes, it isn't such a bad thing. It's not a sheet. So this G of X satisfies all the second sheet. I mean, more concretely, you can like take this definition and go back to what we were doing before. We have these co-cycle stuff. That was what, where the problems were. And what you can do is you can use these identifications of this the trivial bundle to normalize those co-cycles so that they're all like the identity of this one place. And then since they were in GM, that forced them to be the identity of all the co-cycles are going to be trivial. So that's why things work out in that language. All right, so this looks good. And now you have the fact that this thing is the same as G. So the map from G of X to G of X more. Well, the reason for this is easy. I mean, if you have some line bundle in G, say that L is in G of T, and let L0 be the restriction of it to this section, L of x times t. It may not be the trivial bundle of t, so it's some arbitrary bundle. But we're allowed to pull this thing back and twist L by the difference. And that doesn't change the class in G by definition. So I can do this. And that's the same class as L. This thing is obviously trivial on x times t because it's done eight times its negative. So this 
thing naturally that was what I was going GS. Yes. So that shows it's surjective. An injective is just this. So in this case where you have a point, this G thing really is a shift. And so then it's meaningful to ask if it's representable and then it's why it was subjective, I didn't say why it was subjective. And so suppose that you have some L and G of T. Right? So that's a line bundle on X times T. And the condition is that phi bar is degree zero. I'm not going to this. So this L zero is the, the restriction of L to this section. Right? So that's some line bundle on T. And it can be anything. And the point is that if I take this L zero and then pull it back to X, and then tensor its inverse with L, when I restrict this section again, of course I get the identity of the thing, right? So I'm just doing L0 tensor to inverse. So that thing has this rigidification that you need to be in G of X. On the other hand, this G of T is defined as, I mean, it's like the quotient of line bundles modulo of those that come from T. So these two things are by definition the same in G. So I guess I'll give a quick sketch of how this goes. Proof of this representability. I guess first I'll say that uh, if X doesn't have a point, doesn't have a point, then this G is not necessarily a sheet. We've already talked about that. But of course you can think it's sheetification. Get a sheet, and that is representable. And that is what you would call the Jacobian. Okay. So the general definition of the Jacobian is the sheet that represents the sheetification. But then the functor of points is a little. Okay, so let me very loosely sketch the proof of the thing. So we're going to use these symmetric powers of our curve. So for some integer r, this thing is the r symmetric power of x. And it's defined to be the r Cartesian power of modulo of the symmetrical fraction. So Milne, in his notes on abelian varieties, uh, does this. Everything I'm going to say in more detail, so you can look there for all that details. Uh, and you can identify the, the k prime points of this thing. The k is some extension of the k prime is an extension of your field k. This is the uh, degree r dividers. We are effective divisors on the X of the bind of the paper. So I'm going to think of like the 
set of all effective divisors of a given degree as a space by thinking of it in terms of this kind of function. It's like a space of divisors. OK, so if I have two divisors, G and D prime, effective divisors of degree G, where G is the genus of X, uh, then you can, uh, so remember we have this L thing, which is the dimension of the corresponding uh, space of sections of the, vector, the line model that D defines. I'm going to look at L of D plus D prime minus G times our fixed point X. So I'm working under that process that this is not empty and fixing point X. So this thing, so this has degree D, this has degree D, this has degree negative. Sorry, degree G, degree G, degree negative G. So this whole thing has degree G. And so if you look at the riemann roch theorem, it says that L of this minus something is equal to the degree plus one minus the G. So this thing is always at, always at least the degree plus one minus the genus. And the degree is G. So the G plus one minus the genus. So this is always the dimension of these, despite the degree considerations. And that's by reading wrong. And there's some semi-continuity result which says that when you have a situation like this, you put an equal sign here, that's an open condition. I let u be the set of d d prime in x g times x g such that the dimension is equal to one. This is over. Okay, so to do everything I'm saying precisely, I mean, uh, I'm talking about like parameterizing divisors in terms of this base scheme. So you'd want to think of this as actually a family of divisors. So you need to be rigorous about that and talk about what you mean by a family of divisors over some base. No one does all that, I don't have to go into the details. So, okay, so we have this open set, and you can show that it's not empty. You can construct a pair that actually. So if we have one of these guys in this open set, where this dimension is 1, there exists a unique non-zero function f in this space here. Or by unique, I mean unique of the scale. Hmm. Right, we're assuming this space is one-dimensional. So and the definition of that space, I mean, they were, this is the space of functions exactly, so the divisor of the function plus this is effective. So if I look at d double prime, divisor of f plus d plus d prime minus gx, this is effective. Just by definition. And its degree is still g, because the degree of the divisor of that. Think of it as a point in XG. So, in other words, this defines a map from this set that I call U to XG. And U was an open subset of XG times XG. So, you could think of this thing as a rational map. general result that they prove, this is how they constructed the Jacobian, that says whenever you have a situation like this where you have what looks like a group writing but things are only defined rationally, there's a canonical replacement that's an action. There exists a unique group variety, J, 
and uh, birational more. A birational group of work from X G to J. So birational means it's like an isomorphism in the category of rational maps. Okay, so that once you have the dilemma, you've constructed a group variety, and that's a candidate for the Jacobian. And then you just have to prove that it satisfies the correct properties, which I'm not really going to go into. Then you show that this J actually represents J. And it's not it's so hard. Right? J is defined in terms of these space divisors, so it's very close to the way to define them. So that's kind of how you act. All right, so that's the idea of how you construct this Jacobian. All right, so then there's some basic properties. So it just as in the complex case, I mean, you have an identification of differentials in the Jacobian, differentials on the curve, and so it goes through, and a few other things like that. One thing that I do want to talk more about is, um, in, the, in the analytic case, we had the, the singular H1 of the Jacobian is the same as the singular H1 of the curve. Yeah, good question. Yeah. No, I mean, you have to say that the function this represents is related to this function. There's some constructions you have to do. Okay. Uh, right, so in the analytic case, we had that singular h1 of j was the same as singular h1 of the curve. So I want to talk about the replacement of that in this algebraic situation. There is no singular h1, so we should replace it by a top topology. So there's this thing called the Coomer sequence, which I think maybe we talked about before. So here n is going to be co-prime to the characteristic. So this is a sequence of uh, sheaves on x, or really we have calcite of x. Objectives, that means there's a zero here. You get actually this is an isomorphism. So H1 mu n is the n portion in H1 g. H1 g n is pick, right? So this is the n portion in pick. But pick has pick zero, and the quotient by pick zero is z. So all the torsion is in pick zero. 
this is the same as the n portion of Jacobi. And now I can change n to say the power of L to take the inverse limit of the powers. And this says that h1 of x takes bar with zl1 coefficients is the um, eight module to go. So let me explain that zl1. So it, this mu n, I'm working over k bar, and I'm assuming n is prime to the characteristic. So mu n is an tau of k bar, since n is prime to the characteristic. And since we're over k bar, mu n is really just z mod n. So you could just put z mod n z there. And then you take the inverse limit and you just get a ZL, right? That's fine. But the point is that if you wanted to keep track of the actions of Galois with K, you want to keep track of how it's acting on the inverse of unity. And that's what that one is there for. It's the, the takers. And then, I mean, you can move that outside because that's not, that's not doing anything geometrically. It's just in terms of the Galois action. OK, so the Tate module is, is H1 with ZL1 coefficients. And this is basically the same thing as what happened with the analytic case, I mean, the Tate module is, I mean, basically it's like the first to tell homology group, although people don't usually write that. And similarly, this thing would be the first to tell homology group. And the reason you get a twist is because H2 is in ZL, ZL1. And, and so these first to tell homology groups, the two things are the same. So you get the same picture as long as you phrase things in the right way. And the top line is that you Oh, because I think these things, I mean, I, I think what's going on is that H2 is Z01. everything in a relative situation. So suppose that X to S is a family of smooth, connected, projective curves. Okay, then you can, and let's assume that it has a section. You can make kind of the same definition, but in a relative situation, it's some functor g like we have, and that's representable again. So you just go the end in this relative situation. And this is an Abelian scheme now. Well, maybe I didn't say Jacobian is an Abelian right. In this situation, you get an abelian scheme. And so, one application of this, uh, the reason that I mentioned this, is the following situation. Suppose that we have a DVR, R, K is the fraction field, and I 
I have some curve over K, and I let uh, J be a Jacobian. So what this shows, I mean, you can kind of just rephrase that result in this situation as follows. So if x extends to a smooth curve over R, smooth projected geometric connected curve over R, then J has good reduction. Right, because then you take this model that extends to over R and it's Jacobian will be in a view and Abelian scheme extending J, which is what it means for J to So you have this somewhat geometric way to see if you have good reduction in this situation. Any questions? <laughs> 